Hi everyone, my name is Antonio Leiva from antonioleiva.com and today you can see that I'm in a different scenario. This is because I'm doing a, a live training in a company these days, but I, so I'm in my, in my room in the hotel, but, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity this week to release another video uh, talking about a, another important topic that I think that it's really helpful to cover. So today I wanted to talk about coroutines. And what are coroutines? We'll see it in a minute, but coroutines are a great feature for, for coding development. It was the, the preview was released, I think, in 1.1 version of coding, but the final version was released in coding 1.3. And today I wanted to explain you how to understand the most important concepts of, of coroutines applied, of course, to the latest version of coding, coding 1.3, and also uh, to to try to simplify the process of learning it as much as possible. Because what I found when I started trying to learn about coroutines is that everyone said that they were really uh, really easy to, to understand and to start using them. But when I tried to do it on my own, I found that it was, it was not like that. There are many different concepts that are not really not very straightforward. So uh, what I'm going to do here is to split all the information about coroutines into the most important concepts. We'll see them little by little and that way you will be able to, to understand and, and, and to start applying coroutines to your, to your projects. So if you are ready, I'm moving to the slides and let's get started. Good, so let's get started. But before starting explaining what coroutines are, what I'm going to do is to show a problem, a problem that we need to solve, and then uh, show you how to how you can uh, solve it by, by using coroutines. So imagine that you have an, an app like this one, where you have a, a login, a regular login with a username and a password. And when you press login, it will do a request to a server to, to check whether the username and the password are, not, are okay, and then return a set of friends associated with that user. The regular code that we could have if we were using the uh, kind of typical uh, structure with, with callbacks would be we could show the, the progress at the beginning, then called, call uh, the login async, a request that will do will check the username and the, and the password, and when it finishes, it will call a callback. We need this because we need to move from the main thread to a secondary thread so that we don't block the UI while doing the request, while waiting for the result of the request. And then when it finishes, it would do another, a second request uh, asking for the current friends. And it will be the same. When the friends are finished, then it will recover the, uh, the user with the username. It will save the friends inside of that user and then show a toast with the users and the and the site, the size of the of the friends. So uh, once it finished, we would do the progress visibility to go. The there are a, a couple of problems here. The first one is that as we need to do those callbacks, the the readability of this code is a, a little worse that that it should be because you need to understand that one has finished, the second one is being called and all that. And the second one is that if we uh, keep adding callbacks to the to the calls, uh, we'll see the, the effect that is usually called the callback, callback effect. When, when we see that the callbacks keep, keep nesting one after the other and uh, the code becomes much more difficult to understand. But imagine that apart from that, we need to do a second request that apart from getting the current friends, it, it gets a list of the of the suggested friends. This adds up a, another point of complexity about the callback hell that we, we mentioned before, but here it's an extra problem. As we are uh, as, uh, we are waiting to the current friends request to finish before calling the suggested friends, we are losing a, a precious amount of time here because those two requests could be done at the same time. But uh, the problem here is that synchronizing the responses of these two requests is quite complex 
and a regular user would probably just do the easy, the easy path that is called one after the other. So if it's possible to do it, of course, but it's difficult and, and the code that it implies won't be much readable. So here we are having several issues by only because of the, of the use of the callbacks and this type of, of programming. And here is where coroutines come into place. Coroutines are like threads, but, but better. They are like threads in the, in the sense that we can uh, move to a secondary thread to do a, a task and then back, go back to the UI thread to uh, print the results, to show the results in the UI. But it has several improvements. The first one is that you can write a synchronous code, code sequently, sequentially so it means that the the code will be much more readable but will keep the the same uh, power the same uh, features as we were having before with the callbacks and probably using threads or or a library that uses thread use threads and under the hood and the second thing is that several coroutines can be executed in one thread so uh, while the number of co concurrent threads are very limited, we cannot uh, run as many threads a, as we want, in, and especially in a phone device. So uh, while we have that limit here in the coroutines, the number of, uh, of coroutines that we can run is almost infinite because the, the coroutines will be able to uh, optimize the use of these underlying threads, probably one several threads will be used to run all the coroutines but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship so we can run as many coroutines as we want and th those threads will be reused in a in a more in, a, in the best way possible so that uh, we can uh, save the this computation and, and make it much easier so coroutines specifically are based on the idea of suspending functions. This is suspending function is a function that can suspend execution and, and then let the coroutine recover the execution contest when it's finished. Coroutines would be just like the safe place where suspending functions won't normally block the current threat. And I'm saying normally because we'll see later uh, how to do this and, and when it wouldn't happen. So with a coroutine, the code would be something like this. We would have uh, the progress visibility put to visible. Then uh, we could call the a suspending function that would do the logging. And when it finishes, it returns the, the value uh, in the in line to, to the user variable. And then we can use this variable with the next request. And finally, re recover the current friends and the rest of the code is the same. We, we save the friends on the user and then show a toast and put the visibility to on. But here we'll see, we see that we don't have that callback held. All, all the lines are written one after the other, but under the hood, we are doing exactly the same. We are moving to a background thread, doing the blocking task and getting back to the UI thread. We are supposed to be doing that, but we'll see later uh, how we how we need to do it so that it happens that way. Don't pay much attention to the num to the names that I use so far. This coroutine name or the suspended, they are not exactly the names that we are going to use in when creating coroutines. But I just wanted to give you the the skeleton so uh, for now, and then we'll go one by one seeing how they are implemented and. Or, or how do they are they are used is the, if they are already implemented and how can we use them? So here I I have marked the suspending functions. These are the ones that are going to block the execution of the coroutine. When the suspended the first suspending function is called, the coroutine will be blocked at that point, and when it finishes, uh, the the result will be returned to the variable where we, where we assigned that suspending function and we can use that uh, that value in the next one. 
the, the coroutine at that point has recovered the execution flow and it can't it can continue with the with the following uh, request. The second one will, will do the same, will get blocked until it gets the results and then uh, again we can use the, those results with the uh, in the next um, in the next lines. So what are suspending functions? We saw that they block the coroutine execution and uh, they can run on their specific thread. We can configure which one and we'll see later how. But the only thing we need to know is that we need to mark that function with the reservoir suspend and we are that way saying the compiler that that function can suspend the execution of a coroutine. So uh, now I have a question that you can think uh, while I'm explaining this. The, the question I wanted to say is, uh, in this first, li first line that I have marked, when do you think it will be run? If it will be run on the main thread or not? Remember that this is inside the context of a core routine. What do you think? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. You have an answer? Okay. So the answer is that it depends. It depends on how we configure the coroutine context. And we'll see later how to do that. This coroutine context specifies, among other things, because it, it, it will be like the configuration of the coroutine, but among other things, it, it will say the coroutine what's the thread or the number of threads that it needs to use. So here, uh, as I mentioned, the, the coroutine context has one of the configurations is the dispatcher that specifies the threads where the coroutine can be executed. And this dispatcher can be provided explicitly or by the coroutine context. Let's leave the, cor the concept of coroutine context, sorry, coroutine scope until the end because uh, this is a little bit more complex and I want to leave it out for now and we'll see it at the end. So for now, we're going to see how to specify the, the dispatcher explicitly. To do that, the only thing we need to do is to add it uh, as, an, as an argument for the coroutine builder. We haven't seen the coroutine builders there then yet. We'll see it in a minute, but uh, taking in mind that it will be able to receive a coroutine context as, as an argument and there we can specify which dispatcher we want to use. In this case, we are using dispatchers main. We'll see also in a minute the dispatcher we have available, but for now, uh, take into account that, that the main one is the, the one that will use the uh, UI thread in Android. So now we can be sure that this line is being executed in the main thread. But what happens with the rest of functions back and, and the rest of lines? Because of course, the first one will be executed in the main thread, but everything inside that core routine will be executed in the main thread. So we could have a problem if we are running this, those suspending functions inside the core routine th thread. So focusing on those suspending functions, what do you think that it will happen? One couple of seconds again. Okay, I guess you, you realize that it also depends. I mentioned at the beginning that we can specify where those suspending functions are going to be uh, run. And to do that, we can use, there are several ways, but the easiest way is to use the with context function, which is provided by the standard coroutines library. One thing I didn't mention at the beginning is that coroutines are like a very generic uh, definition of the only thing that they specify that is that you have suspending function that can suspend the execution of the coroutines, but uh, you can implement those, sus those coroutines the way you want. But obviously, uh, uh, to simplify the way, the way of using them, calling uh, provides a, a lot of uh, libraries to, to use the coroutines that are already implemented for the most generic cases. But uh, keep in mind that you could implement whatever you need regarding coroutines from scratch because the, the definition is very generic and, and doesn't uh, specify anything in particular. 
And in this case, with the the common coroutines library, we we get this with context function that allows us to modify the context where something is being executed. So if we have a suspense function that is called suspend login that receives a username and a password, we can uh, wrap what this function do does with the with context function and specify through an argument where this is going to be run. If here we say that this will be run in, in the main dispatcher, we would be blocking the uh, the main thread with this request to the server. So this is not what we want, obviously. But it's very easy to change. The only thing we need to do is to change with that dispatcher with another one. In this case, I'm using dispatchers IO. As I mentioned, I, I will explain about dispatchers later, and it's fixed. Now the that part of the code will be run in a secondary thread, and when it finishes, it will return the result to the main thread. It's just easy. That is that easy. Obviously, you can even avoid creating your own suspending function if they are really simple, because you can use with context in line in your core routine. So by what by uh, substituting the suspend that we saw before with, with context, we can do that on another thread just by using a, a different dispatcher that will define a very specific group of threads that in this case are obviously not the main thread, so they won't block the UI. The same with the current friends, and with this we have moved all the and all the worrying parts of the parts that would block the UI to uh, another thread. So let's see the different dispatchers that we have. The the main one, the which is the last one that we saw that uh, you're seeing here, is the Android specific uh, main thread. This is because uh, apart from the common coroutines library, Colin also provides other libraries specific to different uh, use cases. There's one specific for Android that the only thing that adds is this main dispatcher that uh, applies to the main UI thread. But there are three other ones. The, the first one that we see here is the default one. This default dispatcher will be the one that is applied if, if nothing is specified. So uh, in the case that we are using a generic uh, a low, uh, coroutine builder, it will use the default by default, obviously. So this dispatcher is meant to be used for intensive CPU tasks. Uh, these are tasks that are being executed by our apps uh, and that are uh, using, are doing intensive use of the CPU they are because they are proce uh, processing uh, in a big number of elements or because they are doing a complex algorithm, things like that, that our app are, is actively doing. So for this uh, default dispatcher, there will be as many threads as the number of CPUs that our device has. This makes sense because if we are making intensive use of the CPU, it doesn't make sense to have more than uh, more threads because they won't be able to run because the CPUs are busy. The second one that we have is the IO dispatcher, which is meant to be used for input output operations. For instance, a request to a database, to a server, uh, interacting with the device, for instance, the sensors or, the, uh, or, or even file access, everything that, uh, that will block the execution of our app, but that doesn't require any processing from our app. It's just because we are waiting to another element, to another component to return the result. So for this IO dispatcher, we have 64 threads that can be run at the same time. And this is as opposed to the previous one, this is because the CPU is doing nothing, so we can run as many as we want. But the limit they have set is 64. And then there's another one that I'm not covering here that is unconfined. And if you find it, you should be with care because it's very difficult to predict the, the 
thread that it, this is this coroutine is going to use. So, in if you are interested, check out check it out. But uh, for regular uses, you are not going to need it. So now that we have explained how we can move to another context of, uh, of or another execution context with the dispatchers, we now have to explain how to build a coroutine. This is what we call the coroutine builders, and there are several that uh, come already implemented for us. The first one is run blocking. Run blocking will block the current thread to run the coroutine, so it should never or almost never be used. Only for testing is a very specific use case where you will probably use it a lot. And uh, because it will allow allow to call suspending functions and test them without the test being finished before the the suspending function has finished. So in this situation is very helpful. And here it's a very simple example. The second one is the launch, uh, which doesn't block the main thread if we use the proper dispatchers, of course, as we saw before. The launch builder is the basic builder. It will be the one that you will probably always use to, to start a core routine and it returns a job. We'll see later what, how can we use this job. And it also needs a scope. Well, the previous one doesn't need it, but this one does. And we'll see later what it is. As I mentioned at the beginning, we'll, we are leaving the scopes for the end. So for now, we are going to use a global scope. Uh, rely on me that uh, this is a, a way to, to, to start core routines and we'll see later about global scope and scopes in general. So to run a core routine, we can substitute the core routine word that we saw before by global scope dot launch. With this, we create a core routine and inside that core routine, we can execute suspending functions or other core routines also. What are the jobs? The jobs are objects returned by a coroutine that allow us to, uh, for instance, cancel the coroutine or wait for a coroutine to finish. Jobs can also have parent jobs, so if a parent job is cancelled, all the children are cancelled too. And with jobs, we have a couple of interesting functions. The first one is the, is the job join function. This join function is also a suspending function, so it needs to be called inside an execution. Uh, a coroutine context, sorry. So uh, what this uh, what this function does is that it it will block the execution of the coroutine what is called until the task tasks of another coroutine are finished. So that way, if at some point we need that the pre that an a sub coroutine is finished, we can call job join and, and wait for it. The second one that is um, much more used is the cancel function. This cancel function is not a suspending function, so it's, it can be called anywhere. And what it will do is to cancel the execution of that coroutine. So imagine that we are running the suspending task one and we call cancel in the meanwhile. When the suspending task one is finished, the suspending task two won't be executed. And that's how it works. We'll see later an example on where this is really helpful. And the third one that we are mentioning today is the, the async uh, uh, builder. This builder needs a parent coroutine, so it, it cannot be called as the top coroutine. It will need, for instance, to be called inside a launch coroutine, it's a, a launch block of code. And the call doesn't block the parent coroutine, but it starts, but starts running the background task. This can be changed and we'll see it later, forget it for now. And this async uh, function returns a deferred object, which is a, a, specialized job, a specialized job. This object has a new function that is called await, and where, when await it is called, then it blocks, at that point is when it blocks the execution of the coroutine. So with async, we fix another problem that we have had at the beginning, that is that we can very easily run uh, several 
several coroutines or several processes in uh, parallel and then it's very easy to merge the results as we see, we'll see it in a second. So imagine that we have this, this code that is the, the code that we saw at the beginning with the current friends at the, and the suggested friends, but this is already substitute with the coroutine code. Uh, so far we have seen the global scope of launch, the, the with context, the, when the, the first call is finished, it will call the second one for the current friends. That's normal because we need the user to call the current friends request. And when this second request is finished, we would call the third request. This doesn't make sense because current friends and suggested friends could be running at the same time. So we are missing uh, some. Uh, we are missing some time here. We are losing it. Imagine that each of these requests takes two seconds. Takes two seconds. We we will be uh, using six seconds to run these three requests. On the other hand, if instead of using this, we use async, we'll have something a, a little bit different because the only blocking uh, function now is. The, the, the only blocking request is the first one at the beginning. So uh, obviously we need to get the user before doing the, the other two. So this need to, needs to be blocking. But once we recover the, the user, we run the two async requests, the two async, async coroutines, and these are run in parallel. When the first async is run, the request starts running, but it won't block here. So the, the next async uh, coroutine will be launched almost at the same time and both requests will be uh, will be done in parallel. So instead of taking us for se six seconds, it will take us four seconds, the two of the with contest and the two of the of the other two that are running in parallel. If you see here, instead of blocking when async is called, it blocks when await is called. And merging the results, it's extremely easy. We just need to call await, and at the moment that the request finish, finishes, it will return the value in the, at that point. So when these two awaits are finished, we will have the result of the two requests, and we can merge them and save it into the into the friends uh, argument. So it's that easy and uh, so simple that is. Uh, it's really powerful because we won't be doing um, we won't be doing bad solutions just because they are very difficult to implement. This is really easy to do and uh, as as easier in, in fact as doing with context. So the pe developers will be more eager to do it than if they have to uh, to look for a more complex solution. So as I mentioned before, the, the call doesn't block the parent coroutine, but starts running the background task. But we can change this behavior by using the uh, a second argument that is the coroutine start. We can call coroutine start dot lazy, uh, use it as an argument, and that way the the part the the body of the async Coroutine when we execute it until we we until we call await. This is normally not the the thing that we want, but if you need it, uh, be aware that it exists and that it can be helpful under in some current situations. So now uh, moving back to the the scopes, as I mentioned a couple of up times, I wanted to leave them for the end. The scopes are the limits where the coroutines apply. It, and it helps canceling all coroutines when the scope is no longer available. So these scopes are really helpful when we have a, an object or a component that has a pretty well defined uh, life cycle. And the activity is the best example. Imagine that you are running something and that it returns a value, but the activity is no longer alive, it's finished, if we try to update the UI, it's pretty possible that it runs an exception because an activity that is finished cannot be cannot update its UI. So if we have an scope, a scope that dies when the activity dies, we don't we wouldn't have that problem. 
There are two options, the global scope that we used before and can be used by coroutines that can run as long as, as the app is running, that they don't have a, a restricted scope. But if we need a more specific and more restricted scope, we can extend the, the interface, implement the interface coroutine scope. To do that is, is very easy. Well, the global scope, we have seen it uh, already, how it works. And uh, to extend or to implement the coroutine scope, it, you only have to override the coroutine context. This is an example with a main activity. And this is what you will usually need to do if you are uh, creating your own coroutine scope. You have to implement a coroutine context that usually receives a couple of, of values. So I mentioned at the beginning, the coroutine context is a, a set of uh, configurations that you can do to the, to the coroutine. And uh, we have several, uh, several different con contexts that we can use to, to implement this. But the two more typical ones are, are the dispatchers and the jobs. So what we will do here to configure this coroutine context is to use a dispatcher. In our case, uh, we want to use the dispatcher main as the default one. That way, when we call launch, we don't have to specify that it, it uh, uses the dispatchers, the main dispatcher, and we'll also use a, a job. This job is the one that we will cancel when the activity is destroyed. So we define the, the job as a late init variable, and we create an instance in the onCreate. When we run on destroy, we will call job.cancel, and that way, if a, a, a request finishes and tries to update the UI, it won't happen anymore because the coroutine is finished. I almost finished with everything I wanted to tell you, but as an extra, you may be wondering what, what can you do if you are using a, a library that is not uh, that is not um, prepared to use coroutines. That's really easy because we have a, an easy way to convert from the callback world to the coroutines world. To do that, we can use a, a function that is called suspend cancelable coroutine that will do that conversion. It uh, receives a lambda that has a, con has a continuation as a fir first argument and we can do that continuation to return the value once the callback returns the result. Here in our case, when we receive the, the user after the, doing the, the login request, we can call continuation resume and send the user. That way, we define a suspend function that returns a user object, and the, the suspend cancelable con co coroutine will do the conversion uh, from one word to the other by ourselves. As you can see, it's really easy by using the continuation object. And that's all I wanted to cover. Just, uh, just wanted to mention that if you are starting with calling right now, I, I have a couple of, of free trainings where you can start understanding how to create a, a new calling project using Android from, from scratch. And uh, then I explain some of the most important concepts or, or features of the language so that you can start in, in no more than one hour and a half to uh, write your own coding apps from scratch. So we have it in both in English and in Spanish. There are, here are the links and I leave them below in the YouTube description. So if you want to go there and, and join to the, to the training, I'll be very happy to have you have you there. So that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about coroutines. Thank you again for for being here and for listening to to this talk. You also have the the article if you want to read it in, instead of watching this video. I, I also leave it in the in the description. So if you want to review something in particular or some part of the code, you can see it there and also go to the GitHub repository where you can review all this. So thanks again. Hope you subscribe to this channel so that uh, you can receive all the new updates on, the, on this channel, all the new videos I upload. And hope to see you in the next one. Bye.